Hello everyone, uh, welcome back to my channel. Uh, those who haven't subscribed yet, please do subscribe so that I will feel motivated to more, uh, do more and more uh, sessions uh, from neuroanatomy, embryology as well as rest of the anatomy portions. Uh, we have already we were been uh, discussing about the functional areas of the cerebral hemisphere. So this session is again a continuation of the same. Uh, so those who are seeing it for the first time, please make sure that you have seen the previous sessions on the salsae and gyri, the superolateral surface and the medial surface of the cerebral hemisphere. Then only it will be easy for you to understand whenever I mention some of the regions of the functional areas. Uh, so okay, yeah, so what do you mean by functional areas of the cerebral hemisphere? Broadman has actually classified uh, the different regions of the cerebral cortex according to its structure and function into roughly 52 areas. Okay. Uh, and these areas are actually belonging to three major subdivisions. Uh, one, it is mo uh, some areas are motor, some areas are sensory and some areas are association areas. Out of this motor, sensory and association areas, it is said that 75% of the cerebral hemisphere or the cerebral cortex is mainly made up of association areas. Okay. Uh, now, uh, as the word implies, motor area means the region of the cerebral cortex which is controlling the movements of the body. And what do you mean by sensory area? Again, the region of the cerebral cortex which is actually dealing with the different sensations coming from different parts of the body through the thalamus. And uh, association areas are actually areas which are actually uh, trying to have and uh, integrate uh, the functions of motor as well as sensory areas. So, according to this, uh, we have mainly four lobes of the cerebral hemisphere, the frontal, parietal, occipital and temporal lobes. According to this, according to the function and structure, these uh, regions, each lobes will be having uh, specialized areas and they are numbered according to uh, the different numbering pattern of the broad man. So, let us see uh, the functional areas of the frontal lobe in this session. Okay, uh, so uh, the functional areas of the frontal lobe alone uh, we are planning to discuss in this session. Uh, we know that uh, frontal lobe is otherwise known as the motor re region of the cerebral cortex uh, and parietal lobe we know it is mainly sensory. So let us see uh, what are the features, what are the areas which, you are, which we are going to see in the frontal lobe of the uh, cerebral hemisphere. Uh, first I will just mention the different areas which you are going to make out in the frontal lobe. The first and foremost one is the primary motor area, area number 4. Then you have pre-motor area, area number 6. Then you have the supplementary motor area which is mainly seen uh, on the medial surface of the frontal lobe. Then you have the frontal eye field, area number 8. Then you have motor speech area, area number 44 and 45. Uh, again, uh, I will be doing an exclusive session on the different speech areas and the associated anomalies. And uh, one more area that is the prefrontal area, area number uh, 9 to 12. So these are the areas which we are going to discuss in this session. So let us see this one by one. Uh, first one is primary motor area, area number 4. That is actually seen in the uh, precentral gyrus. This is the frontal lobe. Okay, this is the anterior aspect and this is the posterior aspect. So, this is the frontal lobe. We are going to make out the different areas which we have just discussed right now in the frontal lobe. So, area number 4, this is actually seen in the precentral gyrus region. And here, this is actually a granular cortex. When we discuss about the microscopy, this is said to be a granular cortex. G granular means related to the sensory areas, and a granular cortex means related to the motor area. And the importance of this region is there are many giant pyramidal cells, giant pyramidal cells known as uh, pyramidal cells of beds. And the fibers coming from this region, from the pyramidal cells of beds are actually the corticospinal and corticonuclear fibers and they will be actually controlling the opposite part of the body, the contralateral side of the human body and that is how uh, this region is controlling the body. Uh, now uh, in this region, the area number 4, 
we are actually assigning uh, the different parts of the body to this region but it's not according to the uh, number of muscles or uh, the size of the muscle this is actually according to the skill of the group of muscles so uh, suppose uh, if we are going to represent the body we know that this is i'm just schematically representing okay so this is the head this is the neck then you have the trunk then you have the lower limb like this and upper limb like this uh, if you are actually representing the different parts of the human body here we are not going to represent like when we discuss about the human body we know that the trunk is bigger then if you compare with the upper limb and lower limb you know that the lower limb is bigger and uh, likewise if you are going to mention it here that won't actually represent uh, the area number four of the cerebral cortex why because it is not according to the size of the muscle uh, we are going to represent the region in this cerebral cortex okay so then how we are going to represent this uh, human body in this region the precentral gyrus this is actually according to the skill of the group of muscles involved in the uh, in the, in the functioning of the uh, human body okay and we are going to represent it is an in an upside down pattern okay in an upside down pattern so this is the normal representation um, and uh, first of all before we make it upside down let's see uh, when we think about the movement wise or the skilled movement aspect which are the parts of the body which are uh, actually having a greater representation on the cerebral cortex so of course uh, the face will be having a larger representation because we have skilled movements for the facial muscles then the tongue the pharynx larynx all these are having a very highly specialized movements so that will be having a greater representation but when it comes to the neck it will it won't be having a much or much greater representation here then trunk of course it is not that big uh, compared to the rest of the region uh, then upper limb, upper limb, the arm and forearm, they are not having much greater representation. But the hand is, I am showing it as a bigger thing because the hand muscles are very skilled uh, compared to the rest of the upper limb muscles. So hand, I am uh, showing it as having a greater representation. And of course, in the hand, the thumb is again having a major representation. Now after the trunk, we know that this is the lower limb portion. And again there you have the thigh region, uh, then you have the leg and the foot. Okay, why I have drawn this horizontally is up to this point after thigh you have the knee joint, isn't it? Up to this point all these regions will be represented on the superolateral surface and from this point onwards the leg, the foot and the perineal region will be actually represented on the medial surface of the cerebral hemisphere uh, so such a representation uh, when we consider a normal human body uh, we are not having uh, the parts like this isn't it but here it is actually uh, we should say it is an exaggerated pattern uh, with uh, more skilled uh, group of muscles having a larger representation so such a figure is known as homunculus homunculus okay so since this homunculus is represented in the motor area you call that homunculus as motor homunculus and we are not going to place this as it is like like this here we are going to make it upside down that is how you have the representation here so this is how we are going to make it upside down uh, please don't draw such, such diagrams for the exam uh, i'm just showing it uh, showing a schematic representation so that it will stay in your mind very clearly uh, so when you uh, stand upside down uh, i would say uh, our tongue will uh, protrude out you just imagine okay so the tongue actually falling down along with the pharynx and larynx so this will be the lowermost portion here okay our tongue is falling down then followed by head you have the larger head the facial muscles and then you have a smaller uh, neck here then uh, in the upper limb portion you have the hand you have the hand and the thumb with a larger representation uh, then after that you have a smaller trunk portion and you have the thigh portion here Okay, so up to this portion, this is how the motor homunculus is having an upside down representation on the superolateral surface. And after thigh, you have uh, 
uh, the leg portion along with the foot and the perineum okay and the perineal region on the medial surface of the cerebral hemisphere in broadman area area number 4 and that region is known as primary motor area and the fibers are corticospinal and corticonuclear fibers which are arising from the giant pyramidal cells of beds and they will be controlling the opposite half of the body and one important thing which i would like to mention here is even though uh, it is controlling the opposite side of the body. Some regions like upper part of face, tongue, the mandible, larynx, pharynx and some of the axial musculature, they are having bilateral representation. Bilateral representation means this region uh, will be actually controlled by uh, both sides. Okay, both, both cerebral hemispheres. So, even if one side is having a lesion, these areas won't be affected. So, usually the patients present with hemiplegia, that is contralateral paralysis. That is usually the uh, presentation if there is a lesion in the area number 4. Along with that, we have a decreased tendon reflexes as well as positive Webinski sign. So, these are the features which you get if there is a lesion in the area number 4. Now, the next area is premotor area, that is area number 6. That is actually seen in front of the motor area, the primary motor area. And uh, it is uh, not having the giant pyramidal cells of beds. And uh, the fibers which are coming from here are mainly corticorubral, cortico-olivary, and corticonigral. We know that from the term itself, they are actually extra pyramidal set of fibers. Uh, you can go and have a uh, check at the uh, white matter of cerebrum. I have done a session on that. So, these are the extra pyramidal fibers. And when we see this area, we can see that it is broader in the upper part and narrower in the lower part, and a portion of it is also extending onto the medial surface as well. That is area number 6. And they are actually uh, concerned with the programming of the movements. The main movements will be done by the motor area. The walking, running, everything will be done by the motor area, learned by the motor area. But once this program is done, that will be stored in the premotor area, area number 6, because the extra pyramidal fibers will see how this program is working. And after that, the skilled movement will be recorded in the area number 6 for a smooth functioning of the movement. Once you learn one movement, the next time if you do, we are not bothered about what to do next, isn't it? It just comes automatically. And it is said that the writing center, the writing center is located in the upper aspect of the area number 6. So, once we learn this writing movement with the motor area, the next time you are doing it with the help of uh, pre-motor area because it is actually programmed and kept safe in the area number 6. Uh, so, it is mainly from the past experience which you have gained. Now, we can uh, group together the primary motor area and pre-motor area as primary somatomotor area. So, primary motor area with pre-motor area together you are calling it as primary somatomotor area and it is termed as M S1. We can see that uh, the M is represented by capital letter and S is represented by a small letter. Why? Because the motor component is having a major contribution. That is why capital M small s and 1. That is primary somatomotor area. Now we will come to the next region that is supplementary motor area. That is represented by M S2. Again, M is bigger because it is a predominantly motor and uh, it is uh, having a letter 2 uh, attached to it. That is supplementary motor area, M S2. What is the role of this region? Uh, first of all, we should know where this is located. This is actually seen on the medial surface. This is a suprolateral surface and this is a medial surface, right? So, on the medial surface, just anterior to the area number 6, or we can say just as a continuation of area number 6, you get the supplementary motor area or MS2. And uh, here the body is actually represented uh, from anteroposterior aspect. If you draw this as head, uh, the limb will be at the posterior aspect. This is how the, here you will get the head, you will get the neck, you have the upper limb, then you have the trunk, then you have the lower limb. This is how the uh, different parts of the body is represented in the supplementary motor area. Now, what is the function of supplementary motor area? It is this region which 
make you to do something urge to move if you want to move from this position to this position if this area is okay you will feel like moving uh, but if there is a lesion in this region what will happen you will have a tendency tendency to remain at your position you won't feel like moving okay so that's what happens when you sleep for a longer period you maintain that position for a longer period maybe the, uh, you you might be having a lesion in this region right we used to say it as a joke uh, so if you uh, think like that you will uh, get to know the function of this supplementary motor area so an urge to move that is the main function of this area so if there is a lesion on this region that will result in echinacea echinacea means lack of initiation of movement now the next region is known as frontal eye field or area number 8 what is the function of this frontal eye field it helps in the conjugate eye movement conjugate eye movement means voluntary scanning movement voluntary scanning movement uh, so if you ask me to do uh, look from right to left i am moving my eyes from right to left okay so this i am doing it voluntarily even if i am blind even if I am blind, if you ask me to look from right to left, I can do it. Because it's not concerned with vision. Okay. So, uh, what will happen if there is a lesion in the uh, frontal eye field? You won't be able to move your eyes from one point to another point voluntarily. Okay. But, so, uh, my eyes will be, if uh, I am having a lesion on the right side of the frontal uh, lobe, I mean uh, a lesion on the right frontal lobe, my eyes will be looking at the side of lesion. If I am having a lesion on the right frontal lobe, my eyes will be looking to the right. Okay. But if you are asking that same patient or if you are asking me to follow a pen, I will be able to follow the pen involuntarily so that my eyes will be shifting to the left. So that is actually because of the visual scanning mechanism and that is involuntary. So area number 8 is controlling the voluntary scanning movement or conjugate eye movement. So if there is a lesion in this region, you won't be able to move your eyes voluntarily. But if there is a, a lesion in this region, if the vision is perfect, you can make the patient turn the eyes by a, a scanning movement with the help of a uh, with the help of keeping something in front of the eyes so that the patient will look the onto the object and can turn the eyes to the opposite side but voluntarily the patient won't be able to do that is the importance of uh, area number 8 or frontal eye field and of course this area is connected to the occipital lobe through association fibers now the next area is motor speech area, area number 45 and 44, they are pars triangularis and pars opercularis region. They are known as Broca speech area. I am not, not going into the details of the speech area, I will be dealing it in another session exclusively. And the next one is prefrontal area. Prefrontal area means the rest of the frontal lobe lying in front of the area number 6, 8, 44 and 45. This area is known as prefrontal area. And the areas are uh, areas 9 to 12 and a part of it will be seen on the medial surface as well. So what is the function of prefrontal area? Prefrontal area is actually concerned with personality, concentration, judgment. All these things are actually assorted in this region, the prefrontal area. Uh, so uh, this is having connection with all areas of the cerebral cortex. And since uh, the functions include uh, the personality, concentration, judgment, since these are not uh, precise function which we can test easily, uh, this is actually said to be silent area of the brain because the patient suffering from uh, a lesion in this region will be actually presenting uh, with a, a changes in behavior, they will be having uh, a, a tendency to defecate, urinate in the public, they will be having lack of uh, uh, concentration power, they will be sh uh, shabbily, very, uh, dressing very shabbily. So that will be the presentation of the person who is having a lesion in the uh, prefrontal area. Their personality, the 
ability to judge, ability to concentrate, everything will be lost if they suffer from a lesion in the prefrontal area. And it is said to be a silent area of the brain and is having a connection with almost all areas of the cerebral cortex. And so till then, uh, we uh, till now, uh, we discussed about the major functional areas of the frontal lobe. Area number four, primary motor area. Area number six, pre-motor area. Four and six together, you call it as primary somatomotor area. Since motor component is in, uh, prominent, capital M, small s and one. Then we have the supplementary motor area, MS2, which is seen on the medial surface. Then you have the frontal eye field area number 8 where if there is a lesion your eyes will be looking at the side of lesion. If you have a lesion on the right frontal lobe your eyes will be looking to the right side. So it is concerned with the voluntary scanning movement. Then you have the motor speech areas 44 and 45. This area will be seen on the dominant cerebral hemisphere. If you are a right handed person your left side will be dominant and this area the Broca speech area will be seen on the left side. You have to keep that in mind and the prefrontal area area number 9 to 12 which is seen on the supralateral as well as medial surface which is concerned with your personality. So on one fine day uh, the one uh, which uh, usually dresses very well and which usually uh, who usually speaks very politely in the public comes to you uh, uh, in a way uh, which you cannot even accept like uh, the patient comes to you like a drunkard and uh, he goes around defecating urinating and all please don't um, blame him as drunkard always think about a lesion in the prefrontal area because usually this is missed in casualty uh, because normally we expect drunkards to present in the casualty uh, so uh, please keep this point in mind it can be it's not always but it can be a lesion in the uh, frontal lobe the prefrontal area so with this i'm winding up with the functional areas of the frontal lobe uh, i'll be doing uh, the remaining functional areas soon so keep watching thank you